Ever since you can remember, you felt something in your chest telling you to move, to love, to speak, to try. Day after day, you pretend you don't hear it calling, or maybe you dismiss it as silliness or worse. But it's there, ready for you, and it will wait for you as long as you need. My name is Johnny G, and I invite you to join me on a journey of awakening as we dare to embrace our light. This is Refractive. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Refractive. I'm your host, Johnny G. We are continuing along on the Heal Yourself series, and this is the second part of our second topic, Inner Peace. The first part of Inner Peace focused on security and all the ways that our need for security can affect our inner peace in life. And today we're talking about satisfaction. And spoiler alert, it's all about what's happening on the insides, not the outsides, that affects our satisfaction with life. The challenge of this, you know, this is a difficult thing for us to consider. I mean, I think we all realize that how we see the world has a lot to do with how we feel about it. But just because we understand that doesn't mean I'm magically able to see the world differently. It takes a great deal of courage, faith, inner work, discernment, determination in order to really re-architect how I am connecting with my spirit and therefore how I am relating to the world around me. Today's episode is going to talk just a little bit about how we can begin that process of changing our insides so that we experience the outside differently. So just like in part one, let's break this large topic of satisfaction into more manageable concepts. My message today is not how to go out and get more in order to find satisfaction. We're not going to talk about how to get more love, more money, more experiences in order to be satisfied. At the core of this philosophy is that we already have everything. My message is on identifying the leaks in my large cup of satisfaction. Where am I bleeding out my satisfaction? And therefore, instead of feeling serene with life, I'm feeling that the universe is a scary, hostile place. How can I identify the leaks in my satisfaction? Well, in my opinion, based on my experience, there are three powerful topics to examine in looking for barriers to my satisfaction with life. Those three topics are fears, expectations, and intuition. Let's start with fears. You know, one quick note, when I mention fears in this context, I'm not necessarily pointing to phobias. Believing you're not enough, for example, is a fear but it may not tie to a phobia in the way we typically consider them. Body dysmorphia comes from fear. Jealousy is a form of fear. Rage and dishonesty are coping mechanisms for fear. So I just want to make sure that when I say fear, I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, a fear of bugs or or whatnot. I'm really talking about the ways that fear pulls strings behind the curtain. So let's move forward and look at how fears can affect our sense of satisfaction, let's say, with interpersonal relationships. And listen, there could be a lot of valid reasons why a relationship isn't satisfying. Today, we're looking for reasons that tend to punch above their weight, reasons that aren't totally valid, but that still affect us in real ways and therefore encourage us to create pain and chaos for ourselves in life. For example, 
You might be feeling that your friend, family, spouse, partner, child, boss, coworker, whatever, isn't showing up in that relationship in the way that would be best for you or most satisfying for you. And again, listen, it's possible that the person isn't actually meeting your needs. But before we react based on that, it's a good idea to see if there is a fear that is showing up, punching above its weight, and triggering us to, to react in a way that will end up causing us more pain in the long run. That's what we're really talking about. So thinking about interpersonal relationships that might not be satisfying, to get a bit more specific, let's think about a romantic relationship. And I'm sure you can relate to some of the thoughts that I'm going to speak out loud. They might sound like, I'm not getting what I need. I shouldn't have to explain this to him. If my partner was tuned in to me, it would be obvious. What does it even mean if my partner doesn't care enough to give me what I need? So-and-so's relationship doesn't seem to struggle like mine does. Am I wasting my time here? I'm only getting older. Each year, it's going to be harder and harder for me to find another partner if this one doesn't work out. Should I jump now? This isn't fair. Why am I the only one that cares in this relationship? This whole situation is so unattractive to me. It feels like I'm having to force the relationship forward when my partner isn't even trying to meet my needs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so in this situation, when we have these, these beliefs that come up that our needs aren't being met, that we're not being satisfied in this romantic relationship, for example, although this could certainly apply to any type of relationship, colleagues, kids, etc. Here are some of the actual fears that might be behind some of the beliefs that I just listed out. I'm scared to ask for what I need because I'll look like a baby. I'm scared to ask for what I need because I might learn that my partner doesn't care enough to give it to me. I'm scared to ask what I need because if my partner doesn't care enough to give it to me, have I been, been a fool this entire time? I'm scared to ask for what I need because I don't know what I need. I'm scared because if my partner doesn't like that I'm confronting her with this and she leaves, I'll be alone. I'm scared because I don't think I'm good looking enough to get another partner as sexy as the one I have now. I got lucky with this one and I should be happy about it. I'm scared because I don't want to go through the pain of making myself vulnerable with a new person. I don't want to go through all that trouble, all that time, all that hassle, all that potential inconvenience and pain. I'm scared because what if I discover that my partner never really cared much about me to begin with and that I've been a doormat or a sucker this whole time? And what does that say about me? I'm scared because if I open this can of worms and we break up, my child will be damaged by the instability. I'm scared because if I open this can of worms and we break up, I can't afford to keep this house. I'm scared to look at this because my child will blame me for the breakup. I'm scared because if I'm willing to leave over not getting what I need, it confirms how self-centered I am. I'm scared because it means my family and friends were right about my relationship all along, and I cannot face that. On, 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 and on, and on, and on. That's a lot. That's a lot. And each of those individual fears has the power to cause us to act or refuse to act in ways that diminish our satisfaction. Let me say that again. Each of those fears has the power to cause us to either act or refuse to act in a way that will diminish my level of satisfaction. So by looking at where I might experience fears that masquerade as concerns, I can turn on the lights and get a good look at the boogeyman. Remember, I talked about the boogeyman in part one. And I can turn on the lights and get a good look at the boogeyman and realize whether or not the problem is what I thought it was. If the problem is what I thought it was, at least I know I can take action confidently. This is the right path. 
I need to ask for what I need. I need to end the relationship. I need to express myself more clearly, whatever the path is. And on the other hand, if I learn that the problem isn't what I thought it was, that the problem is me, the problem is an inside job here, then I can choose to do inner work around the fears rather than hold my partner accountable for something that he or she has no control over. And that inner work that I'm free to do now around these fears, it could be as informal as journaling or meditating, or it could be as structured as getting professional support, going to therapy, if that's what's best for me. Just knowing that there's a fear involved doesn't take the fear away. And it's important to say that it doesn't mean the fear goes away. But what it does is, in my experience, it helps me see the situation more clearly. It empowers me to put together a solid plan. And it, it helps me to avoid moving in the wrong direction, causing myself and the people around me unnecessary pain. So as we get to the end of that first pillar, fears as it relates to our sense of satisfaction with life and therefore inner peace. Remember, we're, this all relates back to building greater inner peace in life. So as we wrap up the concept of fears, here are some journaling questions that might help you to identify your own deep-seated fears with the goal that once you see them for what they are, you will gradually learn how to resist your knee-jerk reactions to them. So if you'd like, you can go ahead and press pause until you get a pen and paper ready so that you can write down some of these journaling questions. There are two. The first one is, what are the interactions, situations, and news stories that tend to upset me the most in life? What are the fears that exist behind those strong reactions? And where else do those same fears show up in my life? Don't worry, I'm going to repeat this. I know it's a, it's, it's a lot of questions. I'll say it again. What are the interactions, situations, and news stories that tend to upset me the most? What are the fears behind those strong reactions? Where else do those fears show up in my life? I'll read it one more time. What are the interactions, situations, and news stories that tend to upset me the most? What are the fears behind those strong reactions? Where else do those fears show up in my life? The second question, are there any unhelpful ways I respond to the world that I can begin to examine and let go of? For example, judgments, phobias, beliefs, insecurities, negative inner monologues. You might have others. I'll repeat question two. Are there any unhelpful ways I respond to the world that I can begin to examine and let go of? Are there any unhelpful ways I respond to the world? that I can begin to examine and let go of. Some examples might be judgments, phobias, beliefs, insecurities, negative inner monologues. All right, let's move on to the second of our three topics today, expectations. There's a quote from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that I find very, very powerful. My serenity is inversely proportional to my expectations. The higher my expectations, the lower is my serenity. If I find myself, oh, I love that quote. I really do. 
If I find myself dissatisfied with my life, for example, there's a good chance that in a, inappropriate expectations are the culprit. And I use the word inappropriate because I don't want to say that an expectation is right or wrong. It might simply be misaligned or out of proportion or um, out of context. And so inappropriate, meaning it's just not the right fit. Okay. So if I'm, if I find myself disappointed with life, there's a good chance that inappropriate expectations are the culprit. This ties to a point that I mentioned briefly in the part one of this episode, um, where I discussed the Buddhist concept of equanimity, meaning meeting life with serenity in any situation. And as I said last time, while equanimity is a beautiful ideal and it's a lighthouse that I try to fix my sight on and I try to aim for in life. I am not an enlightened being. And until that day comes, I can count on the fact that my serenity level will rise and fall and rise and fall. I do not experience equanimity. I'm just not there yet on my spiritual growth. And if you are, congratulations, because that is quite, quite an achievement. Well, it might actually be an anti-achievement, but anyway, that is quite an experience to discover that you've achieved equanimity. Um, but I'm not there. And so sure enough, whether I like it or not, my serenity level rises and falls based on what's happening around me. Now, what I can say is that my level of serenity today, the swings are much more narrow than they used to be. If you imagine my serenity maybe as a pendulum rather, rather than rising and falling, but swinging to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right, my swings are far shorter than they used to be. And this is a result of simply holding a mirror up to my insides, taking a look at what's happening being honest with myself and, you know, getting curious what's happening here. What's the role my ego is playing in things. So if I want to right size my expectations in life, how do I do that? Like, how do we even take one single step towards right sizing expectations? Well, in reality, if my expectations are out of alignment with what my innermost self truly wants, that connects right back to fears. Okay. So, you know, I mentioned that we're talking about the first concept is fears. The second concept is expectations. The third concept is intuition. In reality, expectations is just a fear, but to simplify things, we think of them slightly differently, which is why I've broken them out to its own topic. So to keep our topics manageable, we'll look at expectations as a separate concept from fear itself. When I talk about releasing expectations, it's easy to imagine that what I'm proposing is a beige, bland, boring life. If I have no expectations for life, then where is my enjoyment? Then where do I, how do I reach for things I like? How do I seek out pleasure if I have, if my expectations are, are neutralized? This is not at all the case. I understand why that might be the first thought you go to. I've thought that as well. And for years, in fact, I tried to want a beige, bland, boring life. I believe that that's what I was supposed to shoot for. And over the course of these years of inner work, I've learned that no, 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 I still have a personality. I still have passions. I have things I like, things I don't like. And um, my expectations are not dialed down to zero. I'm not an enlightened being, but I am a being that tries to maintain one foot in the spiritual world and one foot in the earthly world. So let me talk about 
what that means. Okay, so if I'm not proposing a beige, bland, boring life, when I say our expectations are out of line and therefore uh, a significant cause of our dissatisfaction, this is what I mean. In my experience, expectations tell me that if my life doesn't look like X, Y, Z, something is wrong with it. Okay, so an expectation tells me that if I don't get X, Y, Z, something is wrong. This is a condition. An expectation is a condition. It's precisely what is meant by the word condition in conditional love versus unconditional love. If this condition is met, I am satisfied. If this condition is not met, I am not okay. And so what we're looking for is a way to not base my love that I meet life with on my conditions. Can I be broken up with and still love my life even when it hurts? Can I be fired? Can I lose all my money? Can I experience the death of another person who's close to me and still find love for my life? This is what it's about. The trick to doing this, in my opinion, on my experience, and maybe yours is different, but for me, the trick is to follow my joy. The trick to releasing expectations is to follow my joy. To pursue a life that lights up my spirit without imposing requirements on my life or on God. So what does that even look like? What does it look like to pursue my joy without giving life or God a requirement? It means that when I'm sitting here in this moment, I have a large number of choices for what I can do in this next second. In this very next second, I'm sitting here looking at the camera in front of a microphone, and I have so many options. I can continue saying what I was going to say. I can start singing my favorite song. I can get up and go do a dance. I can pick up the phone and call my family. There are so many things that I can do right now. And the trick is to follow my joy, understanding that what my joy looks like in this second may be very different than what my joy looks like in the next second. So there is a moment where my joy is to continue speaking to you. And there is another moment where my joy might look like getting up and dancing to my favorite song. It's about sensing inside myself, where does my joy lie in this moment right now? And what do I do to access it? Following my joy. The pain happens when I believe that my joy must be X, Y, Z. If I believe that my only joy is dancing to my favorite song, then I'm going to get in trouble at work if I follow my joy. I'm going to not have a good podcast if I follow my joy and instead of speaking right now, get up and dance. If I'm on a date with someone new, 
And I believe that the only source of my joy is to dance to my favorite song. I'm going to make a fool of myself in the restaurant and I'm probably not going to get a second date. And those things, losing my job because I danced to my favorite song, losing podcast listeners because I danced to my favorite song, losing a date because I danced to my favorite song. I'm not saying dancing is wrong. If that's truly where your joy is, you should go for it. But it's when I believe that my joy only looks like dancing to my favorite song. And therefore, to be, quote, true to myself, I need to make my situation fit that. Well, that's where I create pain in my life. My joy right now is in speaking with you. My joy is looking at the camera right now, talking into this microphone, and sharing on a topic that I feel very passionately about in an effort to be of service. That feels good to me right now. That's where my joy is. And I can get up and dance to my favorite song after this is over, and that too will be joyful. Letting go of the requirement, letting go of the condition of life that a good life must look like X. That is a painful, painful, difficult way to live. And so many of us have known a person who has to have a specific job title or has to find a way to pay for our kids to go to a specific school or has to live in a specific neighborhood or has to attend a specific university in order to feel that their life is okay. We all know this. We all know these people. We've been these people. I've been those people. I still am those people sometimes. And that is a painful way to live because it means that if the entire universe doesn't conspire in my favor to give me what I want, then I will be unhappy and unsatisfied. If I arrive to send my kids to that one particular school that I believe is going to be the only thing that makes life okay for them, and I am one slot too late to apply to that school, and I don't get it, well, then I'm set up for a life of pain. Because I have believed that there was only one path to my joy, and I didn't get it. Checking my checking my insides, checking my inner knowing to follow my joy moment by moment is a certain way of finding more satisfaction in life. Because if I'm open to hearing those messages, I realize that there are many, many, many pathways to joy. And it's the ego, it's the ego that gives me a predetermined, unique, singular pathway to find joy, to find security, to find satisfaction, to find inner peace. And that is not the way the universe works. You know, I, I, I'll give you another example. Let's say that I am a high school student and I've determined that in order to have a good life, I must go to a specific university. That's the only university that's going to be, that's going to give me the maximum chances for happiness in life. All my eggs are in one basket. That is a painful way to follow my joy. Because again, what if I don't get in? If I don't get in, if something that happens completely out of my control keeps me from getting in, where am I left? But again, it doesn't mean that I don't get to have preferences in life. So let's look at a different way of trying to get into that particular university that might be joyful and that might open up joy, even if I don't get the exact outcome that I want. So let's say, instead 
of me being that high school student and having to get into that university because otherwise I just, I'm just not going to be at the top. What if I want to go to that university because I love academia and that university does it so well? What if I want to go to that university because I find the quest for knowledge to be exciting? What if I want to go to that university because I'm curious about the experience? What if I want to go to that university because I love stretching my brain? What if I want to go because I'm excited by being around people who will stimulate my intellectual growth? If this is the case, then I am enjoying the path to pursuing that university. I'm enjoying the path of working hard in high school, not as a transaction in order to get the university. I'm enjoying it because it brings me joy, because the path brings me joy. And so if I don't get in, I haven't wasted all that time and effort. It's been a source of enjoyment in my life. And this is a very different situation from the person who needs that university out of fear and then doesn't get in. Then they've wasted, wasted all of that hard work. This is what I'm talking about when I say follow your joy. Examining my expectations in life, personally, speaking for myself, has been a very worthwhile process for me. As I mentioned earlier, today I have more serenity in my world than ever before. And this is the world that you and I live in right now, where people around me tell me that the world has never been more fraught, it's never been more tense, it's never been more polarized, it's never been more unpleasant. That's what I hear. I hear that all around me. My family says it. My friends say it. The news says it. I hear that all over. And I can see what people are talking about. I mean, I'm not blind. I see that people argue. I see that things, I see that there are a lot of people having a difficult time. But by having followed a path of inner work that has allowed me to put down some of my expectations, again, not all, I'm not perfect. My satisfaction with the world is not so sensitive to what happens around me as it used to be. Again, I have changed my insides through this work that I'm sharing with you. And because I've changed my insides, the way I see the outsides is different. It's more peaceful for me. And I'm not special in that way. Anyone can do this. You can do this. It's something that I'd love for you to experience as well if you're not. Here are some journaling questions for examining the role that expectations play in your life. Question one. Which of my life goals are driven by a form of fear rather than by passion, joy, or other positive rational attributes? I'll repeat that. Which of my life goals are driven by a form of fear rather than by passion, joy, or other positive and rational attributes? Two. What do I see as my greatest mistakes, regrets, and failures? Is my judgment around them reasonable? What do I see as my greatest mistakes, regrets, and failures? And is my judgment around them reasonable? 
continuing the same question, question two. Have my expectations around these situations been loving? Have my expectations around these situations been loving? Would I respond to my child the way I've responded to myself? Or would my perspective be different? Would I respond to my child the way I've responded to myself? Or would my perspective be different? All right, let's move on to intuition. This concept can feel a bit nebulous. So I'll share what I mean by intuition and how it plays a role in our satisfaction with life. Remember again, I wanna keep coming back to the main point. The entire focus of this episode is building inner peace by changing our relationship to satisfaction. Intuition, as I describe it, is the guidance that comes from your place of highest wisdom. The guidance that comes from your place of highest wisdom. Some people refer to it as the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Some people call it your inner knowingness, your gut, or even your God consciousness. We're all born with a very clear, very loud connection to this wisdom. Babies know what they need. 24 hours a day. They ask for it unapologetically. Mama birds know when they can push their babies out of the nest and the babies know what to do. As we grow and learn how society works, however, so we have this loud, this clear connection to our intuition, but as we grow, we learn what society wants from us. We learn how to get what we want from society and we learn what the rules are for living on earth. And so our thoughts eventually take over for us. They take over the role that intuition used to play. And as our thoughts become louder, our intuition, out of a sense of kindness, giving us what we're asking for, grows more quiet. So our thoughts become the primary decision maker for us. And our intuition says, okay, if you'd rather me not be so loud, I'll fade into the background. But our intuition never goes away. It stays there, ready for us to call upon it again. We might have to put a little bit of work into building that muscle back up, but it's always there. One of the most precious gifts I've ever given myself was the permission to stop living according to my thoughts and to reconnect with my sense of inner knowing. Of course, again, I don't do this perfectly. I am not an enlightened being. And sometimes I get so stubborn in my thoughts that I wonder if I've made any progress at all. But what I can tell you is that my life path today is vastly different than it was a few years ago because I found the willingness to follow my intuition. And I, I do want to say, I, this is important that in order to follow my intuition, and I'll only talk for myself, I imagine this might be true for others too, but I can't know that for sure. In order to follow my intuition, I have to constantly scan myself for fear and ego masquerading as intuition. Okay, because my fears and my ego sound just like my intuition. And so sometimes I need to ask myself, if I believe I'm being guided to take an action, I need to say, is this an action that is based in love, unconditional, impersonal love, that's not possessive, that's not sticky, that's not conditional? Or is this based in some sort of fear, some sort of ego? This is how people turn from spiritual seekers to cult leaders, right? Because they have these great ideas, these great revelations. They have these great intuitions about, about the spiritual world. And then ego takes over and they don't question it. 
They, it is called, it's a lack of discernment. If we don't, and listen, we don't have time to go into discernment today, but really any discussion of intuition that doesn't take discernment into account is likely to be incomplete. Now, when it comes to satisfaction, let's take it back to the main point, satisfaction as a part of inner peace. When it comes to satisfaction, following our intuition offers a ton of benefits, but we're really only going to look at two of them today. The first benefit is when we listen to our intuition, we stop doing things that feel wrong to us. If someone on the street asks you for money, do you know that tinge of guilt you feel when you pretend you didn't hear them and walk on by as if you can't see them? You know, our intuition tells us you don't have to give that person money, but show that person dignity. Show that person respect. That is a human being talking to you. Show that person respect. What society has taught us is it's complicated if you stop to talk to that person. It's complicated if you look that person in the eye. They're going to hook you in. They're going to ask you a million questions. They're going to guilt you into doing stuff you don't want to do. So just move on, right? And we do that and it feels terrible. We feel kind of like a bad person sometimes. Intuition says show the person love regardless of whether you give them money, but society tells us it's simpler if we just keep going, just keep walking. If at work someone comes up to gossip about a colleague, we know, we know that this behavior is unloving and therefore it dims our light. But maybe we want to be in the know. Maybe we're angry and we want some passive aggressive revenge. Maybe I'm just in a bad mood for no reason. And so I see a chance to roll around in the muck a little. So yeah, let's, let's gossip, right? But when I ignore my intuitive nudge not to do this and do it anyway, I don't feel so good. There is a, it's like, it's like a smoky film. It's like back in the eighties when we smoked in the house and there was like a yellow tar stickiness on the walls. That's what it's like to our spirit when we do these things that our intuition says, don't do that. And we say, hush, I am absolutely going to do that right now. We get that stickiness on us. The intuition is always there telling us to avoid those behaviors. And sometimes we follow it. Sometimes we, uh, sometimes we don't. And there might be dozens of interactions every single day where our thoughts and our societal programming take over our intuitive guidance. And every time we do, we pay that small price in how we feel about life. Life becomes a little bit heavier, a little bit stickier. So that's the first benefit. When we follow our intuition, we feel lighter. When we dismiss our intuition, we feel heavier. And the lighter we feel, the more satisfaction we find with life no matter what is happening around us. Let me say this again. Following your intuition makes you feel lighter. And the lighter you feel, the more satisfaction you will find from life, regardless of the things that are happening around you. War, suffering, pain, illness, whatever. The second way that I've found that intuition impacts my satisfaction is through joy. And we talked about joy a little bit earlier in this episode. If you feel that life is too heavy, too difficult, too boring, too gray, too dry, my experience tells me that you might not be listening to the cues your intuition is providing. Are you following your joy? Intuition always leads me towards my joy. When you wave a toy in front of a puppy, sometimes the puppy is very excited to have it, and sometimes the puppy is not. That puppy's intuition tells it if it's a good idea to play 
or if maybe the puppy's energy is too low and that it will find more joy in plopping its fat butt down and taking a snooze. The puppy doesn't argue with its intuition. We're the same way. How many times have you gotten a nudge that you should spend the afternoon in nature? You should go take a trip. You should go into the garden. You should join a social organization. You should exercise. You should go work on your hobby. And so many times we smush down that intuitive roadmap to joy because we believe we can't, we shouldn't, we mustn't, we won't, we wouldn't dare, we don't have time. In my past life, earlier in this life, when my intuition guided me to engage in a joyful activity and I chose not to, it was usually because I felt I needed to do something more responsible in order to secure myself a better outcome. So let me kind of, let me, let's look at this, right? The reality is I was reducing my enjoyment in life now in order to try to get enjoyment in life later. Do you understand? So, oh yeah, I need to go on a trip. I can't, I have too much work to do. I have to do this work or else I won't have a good job. If I won't have a good job, I won't have a good retirement and I will suffer. Okay. So my intuition is telling me to pursue joy. But I want joy in the future. And I'm willing to forsake the guaranteed joy I can have now for hypothetical joy in the future. That's a bad deal. That is a bad deal. I'm not saying balance doesn't have a place in life. I'm not saying to be irresponsible. I'm not saying to cause harm and pain through carelessness and irresponsibility. What I'm saying is that all too often, my reason for not pursuing my joy has been the fact that I need to do something in order to make sure my life is okay in the future instead. When I could just have a life that's okay now and trust that I'll have a chance to have a life that's okay in the future too. Personally, I've done a lot of inner work around this. And the result is that today, I live a more joyful, adventurous, exciting life than I ever have before. That's what I get today. I do less work than I've ever done ever, my entire adult life. I do less work than ever before. And I experience more luxury, more joy, more adventure, because I follow what my intuition tells me to do, all in a beautiful balance. I listen to my intuitive guidance more frequently than I used to and still imperfectly. At the same time, I get my work done. I meet my societal obligations. I meet my commitments. I give time to my family. I give time to help others. I do a lot of service. It all gets taken care of. And I prioritize following my joy. It's not only possible, this mode of living is the default when we develop the faith and the courage to follow that small voice inside. And of course, not forgetting to apply discernment. Discernment. Remember, ego and fears can sound an awful lot like, like intuition. Staying in bed day after day after day instead of going to work, is probably not your intuition telling you how to find joy. That's something different. Discernment is called for. Here are some journaling questions to help you achieve greater satisfaction and therefore greater inner peace by applying intuition. Number one, 
What activities in life bring me joy? How can I make more space for them? I'll repeat that. What activities in my life bring me joy? How can I make more space for them? Two, where am I trading today's contentment for discontentment in order to increase my chances for hypothetical contentment in the future? Ooh, that's a complicated question, right? Let me repeat it. Where am I trading today's contentment for discontentment in order to increase my chances for hypothetical contentment later? Question three. In what types of situations do I intentionally deny my intuition because of societal norms? In what types of situations do I intentionally deny my intuition because of societal norms? Let's quickly recap today's content. First, let's remember that this was the second part of a larger topic within the Heal Yourself series. Today is part two of inner peace. Part one dealt with security and its relationship to inner peace. Part two digs into how we can change our insides rather than our outsides to find greater satisfaction with life as we move towards learning to love what is. We talked about three concepts that contribute to our level of satisfaction with life. Fears, expectations, and intuition. Each of these three sections offered journaling questions. I encourage you to go back, find them, write them down. Remember, you are your own prison guard. You hold the keys that keep you locked in the dark. And you are the savior you've been waiting for because you can open the door. You have the power within to simply walk out of the cage and into the light. If you're ready for it, that is. Thank you so, so much for tuning into this powerful subject. If you think this episode could be helpful for others, I really hope you'll share it. I hope that you'll go on and rate this podcast, write a review. It helps other people to find it when they search, how do I develop intuition? How do I build joy? How do I find satisfaction in life? They can type those things into the search engine and my podcast will come up, but it does take your help. So thank you in advance for liking, sharing, rating, reviewing. It makes such a big difference. As you go out into the world and you meet all sorts of people who are struggling to find inner peace, do your best to be kind and always remember to aim your light. Take care. You've been listening to Refractive Podcast, and this is Johnny G. If you found today's content uplifting, if you think it might make somebody's day better, give it a share on social media, click like, subscribe. All those things help to expand this podcast availability to new audiences. I'm a speaker, a coach, and a facilitator based out of Washington, D.C., but I travel a lot. If you think I can be of service to you or to your organization, help people get unstuck or move into their authentic power, shoot me an email. My email address is refractivepodcast at gmail.com. Take care. Thanks for listening and aim your light.